Yeah, sure. So, you know, uh, my parents moved to St. Michael's when I, the first year I was born. Um, so, so I was a first generation uh, Eastern Shore Mounts. Uh, my father was a dentist. He had just uh, he had just left. He had been discharged honorably from the uh, from the United States Army, and mom loved to sail. Um, so they selected St. Michael's, and um, and we started. At least I started my life there. Um, it was a wonderful place to grow up. Um, St. Michael's in 1970. I can't remember it, you know, because I was too young. But I can certainly envision kind of what it was like back then. And and dad started practicing. He was a dentist when he first came to Easton and uh, mom was a she was she took care of myself and, and my younger brother um, so dad practiced dentistry um, his entire uh, lifetime living here in Talbot County um, you know, I grew up kind of torn between St. Michael's and Easton because dad his office was in Easton so I attended school in Easton and St. Michael's and um, I played sports both in Easton and St. Michael's back then if you were from St. Michael's, you didn't play for Easton teams, and if you were from Easton, you always, you know, never played for the St. Michael's teams. There was there, so I kind of benefited from you know being able to play, you know, having groups of friends both in Easton and St. Michael's. Um, I went to school. I went to school in uh, in St. Michael's, St. Michael's High School, and about that time. Um, you know, mom, I had left the house, my brother was at school, and, and mom took upon herself a new venture, and she purchased Carpenter Street Saloon. Um, you know, in those days, this is 1980, 1979, uh, St. Michael's was still not a touristy type destination. And we're a fishing village, there was a lot of carpentry, there was um, some industrial work being done, things like that. The, the sidewalks were all concrete, we didn't have brick sidewalks and uh, and that was a labor of love for her you know she had been involved in the hospitality industry um, younger in her lifetime so so dad was the family dentist and uh, and mom was the the restaurateur uh, she, I got through got through high school I graduated from college from the University of Dayton in Dayton Ohio and then I went to law school at Ohio Northern University um, for some reason, at some point in my life, I decided I wanted to become a lawyer. I'm not sure how it happened. It just kind of transpired. Um, but getting into law school was quite an experience, you know, and, and I learned very quickly that um, making a living as a practicing lawyer was very different than what it appeared on the outside. And so I had to make a decision going through law school what to do. And I, I really wasn't comfortable coming home to Talbot County where I knew so many people. We had grown up with them, we were friends of friends, and then um, being a person for hire to take sides in disputes. That just is not, you know, that's not my, some folks are more programmed for that type of, of work and that really wasn't, didn't suit me. And I did some intern, some different interning in different places and um, I found a position on Capitol Hill. and. Uh, and I, got a, I had an opportunity to work with a, a congressman from Chicago named Henry Hyde and uh, with the House Judiciary Committee. And, and that was an immediate fit. I knew the minute I was there that I had found the place that would be the great next step from, uh, from law school. I worked for Chairman Hyde and I worked for Chairman Sensenbrenner. Um, we had gone through the Clinton impeachment we had gone through 9-11. I was very involved in the Clinton impeachment and um, I was very involved in 9-11. Um, a lot of the legislation that came days after 9-11 came through our committee. Um, but we got to a point where I, I sort of hit, hit the wall with Capitol Hill and uh, it, be, it was becoming pretty partisan and I was looking to try to find a way to come home and, um, and I went and, and got an opportunity to work with Governor Ehrlich and um, at the end of his first term it was ready to, I was ready to make another move, and I was looking towards, you know, uh, full-time working at home. And, um, and a congressman that I had worked for in the past, um, when I was on, on the House Judiciary Committee, called me up. His name was Howard Coble from Greensboro, North Carolina. And, and I accepted and went back to work in Congressman Coble's office. And uh, at that time, I had become a little bit of a seasoned uh, uh, legislative lawyer, and I could manage my time. Um, I was, that, throughout that period, you know, mom was running the restaurant um, and I was sort of like a backdoor guy. We would talk. Um, also, you know, an incredibly important part of my life was in 2005, 
my wife Rebecca and I married. And um, so that was a big change. And, and then in 2007, my, uh, my son Johnny, who's now 14, you know, he came on the scene. And uh, shortly thereafter in 2010, my, my daughter Evelyn, she came on the scene. Um, in, in 2010, um, and we had a tragedy in the family where my mother had a, ser a very serious stroke. And um, I, at that time, there was no one to run the restaurant. So, you know, I had my responsibilities at home. I had my responsibilities back in the congressional office, but I took over operations of the restaurant. Um, so that started in 2010, and we started, you know, helping mom with, uh, with, with her recovery, um, which has been a miraculous recovery, really has. You know, we kind of made do with what we could. It was a very challenging time. Our local state delegate, um, Jeannie Hathaway Riccio, um, announced that she was going to uh, run for the governor's office as lieutenant governor. Um, and I knew I was making a change. And all the while, in running the restaurant and growing up in St. Michael's, I had never experienced a downturn, an economic negative uh, um, um, environment that we were experiencing. The numbers were actually going, they, they had always gone up, they had always steadily gone up. Um, there were good years and bad years, but there was just this sense that the, the, the government is just choking um, the Eastern Shore. You know? I knew there was a, a, an opportunity to run for office, and, um, and I thought long and hard about that, and, and, um, and, the, and the, our future of the children growing up, uh, the business, carrying on and, um, and so much that we had put into it. And I thought that one of the best things that I could do is actually get some skin in the game and sign up and run for office and, and be a representative and a, um, and a um, voice for, you know, for the Eastern Shore. Um, but so I've been blessed in 2014 getting elected and, and the, I was placed on the Economic Matters Committee in Annapolis where we work on business regulation and um, and, and related matters, um, but I bring a lot more to the table than just you know my background in, in business. Um, and so, oftentimes in the House of Delegates, I get involved in a lot of the um, the, the debates over the Bay, uh, over uh, uh, environmental issues, um, over transportation. Um, we deal with a, a lot of transportation things, a lot of things dealing with agriculture. Even in the minority, if you if you if you're prepared and you have the correct information, you can influence the way bills are shaped and how they how they um, and how they move forward. So you know, the you... first thing that you know I wanted to push was broadband deployment, and I, I, my one argument was is that there there are two Marylands. There's the connected Maryland and the not connected Maryland, and most of rural Maryland was not connected. Mm -hmm. We didn't have the means, we didn't have the infrastructure, we didn't have the support. And, you know, at first, a lot of people kind of snickered, and they said, yeah, we've heard that before. You know, there were some other delegates that had talked about it in the past. And, um, and I, I think the fact that we were able to move significant, um, we, were, we were able to achieve some significant progress with broadband deployment, I think most of that was driven by COVID. You know, um, we, we had, we, the timing on that was perfect, but we had worked on broadband deployment, you know, um, for a couple of years prior to COVID. Uh, we had gotten the governor to create this rural off, this office of rural broadband, which hadn't been created before, and we actually got him to put money into that. We made enough noise about broadband deployment that Chop Tank Electric, which prior to that didn't want to have any conversation about doing broadband deployment, they came to the table. And you know, they pushed legislation to, to change some rules so that they could do broadband deployment. At the same time, um, Eastern Utilities got involved. They eyeballed a um, U.S. Department of Agriculture grant where they would be able to do broadband deployment. So we brought all the forces together yeah. to get things turning. Now it's kind of going a little sideways here with COVID because it's gotten so much attention that the resources are not being driven just towards broadband deployment. They're, they're driven to other areas of, um, of um, broadband um, interest. But, but that, that's one area, just coming in. And I, I call that like just common sense. I'm just a regular guy, I run a restaurant, I got to, I, I'm, I'm in, we are raising two um, wonderful children. You know, we're fighting the tide. You know, every
Um, Addie is a dear friend of mine, um, at least, you know, I, I'm sure she's probably looking at me funny right now because I filed for the Senate. I mean, it was not a surprise for her. Um, I, I, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for, for Addie, and, um, and I did think about this. And, you know, we're elected to serve the people, and the people have an expectation of, uh, of what we're doing. And, and, and to me, I hold that very high, and, and, and I feel as if um, I need to produce in the position, you know, the position is not a, um, um, is not a, I mean, it's an incredible humbling honor, but it's not, um, it's not uh, um, an experience. It's a job. I mean, you need to go represent. You need to work for the people. Um, and that's a, a feeling and a sense I take to the job. And I probably picked that up from working with those, those other members of Congress. Um, you know, they, um, they were very, uh, they had a deep impact on me personally. Um, and um, we got to a situation um, coming up to this year where a lot of people were coming to me asking me, you know, what are your intentions? What are you going to do? Why aren't you doing this? It is, you know, they're telling me it's time. And you know, I, I thought long and hard about this, and 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 I look back and try to assess. It's kind of hard when you're in the job because you go day to day, and you really don't look from the outside about kind of what's going on. And and there are a lot of changes that are taking place right now. But you know, Addie's had a, a fantastic 28-year career, and. Um, and, and, and she's helped so many people out. And she's a friend of mine, she's a friend of everyone's. But at some point, there needs to be a change. There, there, there will be a change. And, and um, obviously, she doesn't feel that the, the time to change is right now, because she's, she's running again. However, I've, I've got a different perspective, because I've, I've talked to a lot of people, um, and, and I've seen different things you know, over the last few years that indicate to me that, yeah, we need to change. We need, uh, we need something different. The first foremost thing of anybody who gets elected in Maryland as a representative of the citizens, your first foremost thing needs to be, how are you gonna watch the taxpayer dollar? How are you gonna protect the dollar? We are taxed, at, at, we are taxed and feed to death in Maryland. Um, and and, and it's, a, it's a big problem for, for us on the shore. Um, we've lost a lot of people because of it. There was a little bit of tax relief this year that will last a few years, um, but that is by f that is a priority. Um, how is the money being spent? How is it being used? Um, we know we've come off of a time where government has changed. Uh, I think a priority of uh, of finding ways to rein in government power, you know, rein in government control, so that things are there's accountability. And we've had a huge number of issues statewide dealing with health officers and mandates and restrictions and who's in charge and counties, uh, that, that has got to be a priority. So, that, so who, there's got to be accountability for the government, right? Um, education right now is a huge problem. Um, uh, uh, critical race theory, gender identity, these things are, are, are becoming extremely controversial and parents are very concerned about what's happening in schools, and they deserve to be involved. And along the lines of education, um, uh, you know, a, a top priority for, for all of our school systems on the shores, how are we gonna be funding our school systems? Because Kerwin was, was uh, baked as a doable proposal, and within a year, we were already told that it's not doable, you know? And we're gonna have to fund that. So our counties need to know what they do, what they must do, and what they have discretion of. We already have some counties that are saying they're not gonna comply with some of this because it doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make sense. And, and I will be there for our law enforcement. Uh, the police reform that we did uh, was very problematic. There are real present issues right now with law enforcement because of police reform. Uh, that's something I'll be very involved in. Uh, election, the integrity of our election system. I, I'm a big fan of paper ballots. I love having a paper trail. Um, and, uh, and the absentee ballot does serve a important uh, use. However, it also can very easily be abused. And loose rules with absentee ballots is, in Maryland is very scary. That's election, election issues. And a personal thing for me, the day to get elected, and it's got to happen, is we've got to get a new hospital. We have absolutely, positively got to get a new hospital. People have laughed about it. They put it off. 
Um, we've been told about this. Money's been allocated. Um, we have poured millions of dollars into the University of Maryland system over in Prince George's. Uh, we've had the property outside of Easton. If it's not going to be there, it's got to be somewhere. Um, our hospital is aged. Um, our our healthcare workers are tired. They've been through a very rough experience with COVID, um, and um, and I've seen the numbers to, for building a new hospital are very large. There's no doubt about that. Uh, our budget last year for the state of Maryland was very large. Also, it was 61 billion dollars. Um, there's there is a way to do this and to fund this. And, um, and that would be probably my top priority personally is to see you know, that groundbreaking and to have that building constructed and to have that project moving forward. It's something